So as Carl Sagan said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it's not because we haven't found uh, evidence of aliens that there are no aliens. And I think it's, the, a similar argument can be said about uh, the Fermi paradox. It's not because we haven't found uh, a proof that um, it's not it's not very near or it's not possible to, to find it. There is, I think there is nothing strange that we haven't found a proof yet. It's just that we haven't dedicated enough resources to, to search for life and intelligent life. Well, uh, let's talk about the uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's a, uh, a long-standing human uh, fascination. It has its expressions in various uh, searches uh, today in terms of uh, uh, looking for electromagnetic uh, signatures or communications or uh, the gases of exoplanets that can be uh, assessed through spectrography that is uh, when the host star uh, shines through the atmosphere, various ways to, to go about it. But the fundamental question is, with uh, a universe of uh, 10 to the 22 stars and at least that many planets in the observer, observable universe and uh, a, set, a small set of that, but a huge number of habitable planets that the likelihood of life and intelligent life seems enormously high. And yet, in Fermi's paradox, famously, where are they? We don't see any any examples of it. Uh, and so that is a um, not a contradiction, a a deep puzzle. Uh, how do you address the question? Yes, I, 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 I don't think it's a paradox. So as Carl Sagan said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it's not because we haven't found uh, evidence of aliens that there are no aliens. So he, it was an argument that he used to counter the, some colleagues such as Frank Tipler who, who were arguing that we are alone in the universe. And I think it's, the, a similar argument can be said about uh, the Fermi paradox. It's not because we haven't found uh, a proof that um, it's not it's not very near or it's not possible to, to find it. There is, I think there is nothing strange that we haven't found a proof yet. It's just that we haven't dedicated enough resources to, to search for life and intelligent life. And so you, you have some, uh, shall we say, uh, original, if not strange, proposals to, uh, uh, to ex expand our uh, technological assessment of, uh, of, of signatures that could indicate life. Yes, yeah, so I, I propose to extrapolate the two fundamental trends of the, the development of civilizations. One is energy use using the Kardashev scale. So this idea that civilizations are able to, to use the energy of their planet, of their star, and then of their galaxy. So that's the energetic extrapolation. But to this, I added the, um, the miniaturization extrapolation, and it's, it's from an idea of, uh, of John Barrow, so I called it the, the Barrow scale. And his idea was to say, wait, 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 don't look just at these very big uh, growing civilizations, but look, all, uh, look also at civilizations that would master the inner space. And as you know, the, there is plenty of room at the bottom, as Richard Feynman was saying, and the, the bottom scale in physics is the Planck length scale at 10 to minus 35 meters. And in a way, with our technology, we are just at the beginning of, of mastering these small scales. We are entering into the realm of nanotechnology, but nanotechnology is only 10 to the power minus nine. And so there is a lot of room to, before we reach the ultimate control or mastery of, of matter. And the interesting thing is that if you combine these two ideas, the, the idea to, to master very small scales and high energy use, um, I came up with a reinterpretation of some uh, binary stars that are in accretion, so where you have a compact object that can be a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole. 
that sucks in a companion star and they also eject jets or, or, or matter out of the system. And when I first saw this kind of system, I thought, well, they look like uh, they could be a, a pre, uh, kind of life form because you have all the ingredients, you have energy um, utilization from the companion star, um, and there seems to be some kind of entropy export or waste production when, when they eject things out of their system. Um, and the metabolism is a kind of universal definition of life. All, all living things, uh, even pseudo living things like cities or your computer, they take in energy and they dissipate heat and, and waste. So I proposed this idea uh, back in 2010 and I'm still trying to, to test it today. <laughs> And you call that a, a stellivore, like a, yes. a, a carnivore is a, a life form that eats meat and a, a stellivore is a life form that eats stars. Exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, so, and, and you mean this in, in, a, in a quite literal sense that the, um, that the, the, star, the star themselves or whatever doing the eating is a living organism, not that living organisms are using that for their own sake which is the, the traditional scales about how how life forms can um can harvest the the, the planetary the star galactic energy so you're not saying that it's not a harvesting it is literally that that is a life form in itself that's right that's right and uh yes i think this idea brings a lot of skepticism <laughs> um, because we are used to think of life as being carbon based and that, that we need to be not too warm, not too cold, have liquid water, all these requirements. Um, but through the years, my, I got thinking into more and more uh, abstract and universal ways. And, and what you need for, for life is actually to perform functions that allows you to to live and um and there is I, I don't think there is really the need to to focus on, on on that life has to stick during billions of years or trillions of years to to, to carbon based life and so an analogy that i bring often about this idea is uh, to look at the history of computing machines of computer hardware it has it has overgone um several revolutions from the first computers were using vacuum tubes uh, to, to switch bits and so on. Uh, up to today, we have microprocessors and tomorrow we might have chemical or quantum computers that, that do essentially the same operation. So what you want is that your computer is able to be Turing complete, that it can perform all kinds of computational operations so that you can run any program on, on it, but you actually don't care at all uh, how it's implemented the hardware that, that does it. And I think we can make a similar case with life. Life needs to be able to, to adapt, to metabolize, to reproduce, but um, there is no need that all this function must be uh, implemented with, with carbon, life and water. So it sounds like you are rather than uh, explaining uh, the the uh, uh, Fermi paradox and and finding aliens in these uh, in these stellivore uh, combinations, but rather expanding the definition of life and generalizing the concept of energy transfer m metabolism, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, that's an interesting approach, but I, 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 it doesn't sound like it addresses the the Fermi paradox. Well, uh, yes, I agree with what you say. It, it broadens the search tremendously, which in a way is good to broaden the target, but it's also more challenging because then you still need to make models and predictions to, to turn this into, into science. But uh, so, well, if the study of our hypothesis is true, it does solve the Fermi paradox. It's just that we wouldn't have recognized that these were living systems um, because they're, they are so different from everything that we know that is living. Um, 
And if I, if this is wrong, if the study of our hypothesis is, is wrong, then yes, we should keep searching. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.